Hey everyone, in this video we are going to talk about a couple topics regarding internet security and the cloud. Uh, how organizations can make use of the cloud in a more secure way. Uh, I've kind of mentioned this a little bit when it comes to talking about the cloud, talking about the internet, how all of this kind of stuff can open up a lot of potential security vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. And this kind of goes hand in hand with some of those topics that I've mentioned before. So yeah, this is a very brief subset of all the possible information we could be talking about regarding internet security and an organization's use of the cloud. A lot of it is way too technical for what we're really worrying about for this class. So this is more of talking about a few higher level concepts that some organizations might want to have a at least a very brief understanding of in order to see if that kind of makes sense for the organization. Now, if you're interested more in security, um, you know, there's a couple of classes within the CBOT family of classes at Allen Hancock that you could take a look, although I believe that's more along the lines of personal security and then network security. Um, you'll have to look at the catalog yourself. And I am also happy to talk in, you know, as much detail as you are willing to hear about various security topics because I do have an interest in researching security at all kinds of different levels. Regardless, that's the primer for this video. Uh, let's get into it. The first concept we're going to talk about is a virtual private network. Now, let me kind of lay the groundwork for justifying why we might use this technology before I talk about what this technology is. So specifically in the case of uh, running an organization where you have resources that are locally accessible, but are not accessible through the internet. So for example, maybe you have some data that is rather sensitive that you wouldn't want accessible to the internet so that some, uh, some malicious actor could come in and get access to that data. Or maybe you have some company specific applications that are running on servers within that local site. Uh, in this case, in this diagram, it looks like the Chicago site right here. Be, maybe the Chicago site is hosting, for whatever reason, hosting some applications that employees need to use in order to do their job or something like that. Another example is, um, yeah, this is a real life example for me personally. When I was a student at Cal Poly, they had um, servers that were locally accessible that you could use in order to do research, but you couldn't access those servers from off campus. You had to be on campus. Your computer had to be connected on campus in order to access those servers to take advantage of all that server room and run whatever programs you're trying to run. So it's very possible that you have situations like these where there are resources you need to access that are only locally accessible at a specific site and where you are not actually on that site. So you can't actually access them in the normal way, at least. That's where a virtual private network might come in. Now, normally when you are doing anything on the internet, let's say you're trying to access a server in order to look at their website or use a cloud application or get access to some data or something like that. We've talked about the server client model where the client sends a request to the server, the server validates that request and then sends data back to the client if that request is valid, right? Well, the actual specifics of it is that the client computer, let's say this is you making this request to a server, your computer is going to send a request and that request is going to get transmitted from your computer to your router, which then gets transmitted to your modem, 
which then gets transmitted to your internet service provider. And thanks to somewhat recent legislation, the internet service provider is allowed to look at that request and try to get information about you based off of the data that they can see in that request. But then, you know, what they're also going to do is they will forward that request to the internet. And that is essentially going to hop through what's known as a bunch of name servers. We're not going to get into the details of that, but it's essentially passing server to server to server to server until it's able to get the to the internet service provider of the server, the uh, the destination server that you're trying to get data from. So then that internet service provider, you know, they'll try to get some information off of that um, request that you made, and then they will forward that along to the destination server. And then the destination server will get that data, or, you know, get that request, validate it, send the data back, that data goes back through their, through their ISP, and then it will go back through the internet, uh, tra bouncing through a whole bunch of servers until it gets back to your ISP, which will then send it back to you. And then once you get it, you actually you know, it goes to your modem, then to your router, and then to your actual computer. And that is the path that data will actually take. Now, when you use a VPN, uh, it works a little bit differently. Um, what happens is you have a VPN client that you install on your computer. It is a program that, um, you know, it lets you turn it on and off. Maybe you have some settings for how the data is handled or something like that. But when you turn it on, it's going to create what might as well be a direct tunnel to your VPN server for all intents and purposes. Um, now, you're still taking the same pathway. You're not actually creating a direct tunnel to a VPN server because you still have to follow the existing uh, inform the, the existing information highway. So you still have to send data through your ISP, through the internet, over to the destination server, except instead of going to the destination server, it is going to the VPN server. And then the VPN server forwards that to the destination server. What the VPN tends to do is it tends to wrap the request that your computer is making to get data from the destination server. It kind of puts it in a box. It padlocks that box with a key that only the VPN server is able to open or requiring a key that the only the VPN server has. And then it will send that locked box to the VPN server. So your ISP will see that you're sending data over to a VPN server, but it won't actually tell exactly what's inside of that locked box because it doesn't have the key, only the VPN server has the key. So then the VPN server will find that locked box, it will unlock it, it will take the request from inside of it and then pass that request on to the destination server. And then, you know, the destination server gets the request, validates the request, sends you back data, except it's sending data back to the VPN server. And then the VPN server takes that data, it locks it up, padlocks it with a key that only your VPN client has, and then kicks it through to through to its ISP, and then uh, bounces through the internet, goes to your ISP. Your ISP can't see what's inside. Uh, that padlocked data then goes all the way through to your modem, then your router, and then your computer. So the VPN server, essentially what it's doing here is two things. For one, it's making sure that nobody in between your computer and the VPN server is able to actually see what's inside of the request or the data, the request that you're making to a server or the data that you're getting back from a server which is really nice if you're trying to access potentially very sensitive information. It's all cryptographically locked. Uh, it's very secure. 
um, VPN companies will say that their encryption is military grade, but really all encryption tends to be military grade if they're using the most up to date encryption, just for the fact, the simple fact that the military uses the most up to date encryption. Regardless, um, all of that data is cryptographically locked. So if there happened to be someone snooping in the middle who was trying to see what kind of things you are accessing and what kind of data you're getting back, um, they wouldn't be able to see it because of that cryptographic lock. So that is one benefit of a VPN that most VPNs actually will provide. Uh, it's not necessary, I believe, for the virtual private network specification, but most will cryptographically lock everything so that things aren't actually visible from inside. The other benefit is that the destination server, rather than seeing that the request comes from you, they'll see that the request is coming from the VPN server. Here is why that's really helpful for an organization. So we have all this stuff in this example, we have all this stuff in the Chicago site that you might want to access. What we also have within the Chicago site is a VPN server. Now, let's say you are in Los Angeles. If you're making your request to the Chicago site to access something, the Chicago site is actually going to be able to tell that this request is coming from outside of the Chicago site. Specifically, they can tell it's coming from Los Angeles. So because it's not coming from specifically within the Chicago site, they're going to say no. And this could apply for any place that you could be accessing data from the, trying to access data from the Chicago site that isn't within the Chicago site. You could be at the coffee shop next door to the Chicago site trying to access that data. And as long as you're not connected to the Chicago site internet, then they're going to deny your request. But since the VPN is in the Chicago site, since it's connected to that same network, if you are using a VPN and connected to this VPN server, well, everything inside of the Chicago site is going to see that all these requests you're sending are actually coming from the VPN server. So they say, well, hey, this uh, request is coming from within the Chicago site, so it's okay for us to use. They'll send that data back to the VPN server, and then the VPN server will send that data back to you, no matter where you are in the world. So it's a good way of bypassing this requirement of having to be strictly in the Chicago site. That's kind of why we call this type of connection a tunnel, because you have a direct tunnel that leads you straight over to the, in this case, the Chicago site or wherever the destination of your VPN server may be. Now, if you're inundated with VPN ads, uh, which a lot of people seem to be on the internet nowadays, and they happen to talk about how you're able to watch, you know, you can watch shows on Netflix that are blocked in the United States by changing your location. The reason why that's possible is because major VPN companies are going to have servers located all around the world. And because they're located all around the world, you can choose a particular server that is located in a different country, let's say Great Britain. And then all of a sudden, all the requests that you're making look like they're coming from Great Britain. And then websites might treat all of your requests accordingly. They might show you different data because they think you are in Great Britain because your requests are coming from Great Britain since they're being sourced from the actual VPN server rather than your actual computer. So that's kind of how virtual private networks work here. I want to explain something about this diagram real quick. Um, this blue rectangle within the Chicago site is a, in a sense, a virtual computer within the Chicago site that is able to get all, uh, you know, connect connections to all of these databases or resources or whatever. Um, so the VPN client is essentially pretending like you have a computer inside the Chicago site. That's what is going on with this blue box right here. Whereas in reality, you are all the way over here in this VPN client box, you are running the VPN client and all of your traffic is passing through all that. So you're out here, but the Chicago site thinks that you are actually inside of the Chicago site. So when you're using a VPN, traffic 
appears to come from the VPN server. Rather than coming from your computer, all of your website traffic looks like it's coming from that VPN server, which means that it will have, you know, the the source location, you know, source country information, all that kind of stuff will be the VPN server, which has its upsides and downsides. Um, its upsides are if you want to look like you're in a different place for whatever reason. For example, like if you're trying to access something in the Chicago site, in that example we were talking about previously, that's you trying to look like you're in a different place. Or if you're trying to access things that are region locked, uh, so changing your country to view certain shows using a VPN, um, you know, that is a benefit of using a virtual private network. Businesses could definitely get a lot of use out of virtual private networks for cases like this Chicago site where you have to access resources that are local only to the Chicago site using a VPN server to make it look like you're actually part of the Chicago site. I brought up this example of Cal Poly having research servers where people could actually run programs on those servers to do some sort of academic research. And I had to run some really intense uh, artificial intelligence programs that were made to play the game of 2048 very well. I don't know if you are familiar with the game 2048. I would look it up if you are not because it's a very fun and addicting game. But for a while, a lot of people had been doing research on using artificial intelligence to optimize score in that game and I was one of them. My research project was trying to find strategies to help optimize human play, help humans uh, get the highest score possible in 2048 using artificial intelligence as a tool to evaluate um, different strategies that humans might be able to work with. Now I had to gain access to these servers to run uh, someone else's program as part of my background research, but I wasn't on campus super often because this was over the summer and I was pretty far away from the actual Cal Poly campus, so I wasn't able to actually walk onto campus and get access to these servers myself very often. So what I had to do was I actually had to use a virtual private network in order to make uh, my connection, force my connection through Cal Poly in order to make it look like my computer was actually located on Cal Poly because all of my connection requests were going through this virtual private network. Um, you know, I was able to make it look like my computer was on Cal Poly. All the requests were coming from this server that was located on Cal Poly and I could access the research servers in order to start running the programs that I needed to. So that kind of example is going to be a huge use case for businesses um, who are trying to run VPNs. Now traffic can be encrypted between the VPN client and the VPN server, which means that your ISP cannot actually see any of the data that is going between your computer and the VPN server. Now, something to note is that the VPN server is able to see everything. So your requests might be encrypted between your computer and the VPN server, and the data coming back to your computer might be encrypted between the VPN server and your computer. You know, they might have this cryptographic padlock on your requests and on your data that prevents your ISP or anybody in the middle from actually seeing what's going on there. The problem is, is that your VPN can actually see that data and they can see the requests that you're making and they can harvest that data and try to build advertising profiles off of you that they then could sell or possibly do worse if you are of a more uh, scared mindset. So you're not completely protected from 
privacy breaches or anything like that by using a virtual private network. I, I say this, it's so important for me to say this, by the way, because VPN ads totally claim the opposite. They, they talk about the, um, the fact that your information is protected between your computer and the VPN server. So your ISP can't see what's going on. And yes, that is completely true, but they can see what's going on. They can build advertising profiles off of that kind of data. And if you ask me, I think that's why they're really trying to sell that they're so good for privacy because they're trying to get people who are worried about privacy on their platforms and then build advertising properties off of them. But I don't know. That's just, that's just my hypothesis. Regardless, it, it is important to know. If you're working with really sensitive data, you want to work using a VPN specifically built and configured by the company you're working for. If you're using a third-party VPN, that is a potential source of loss of privacy or security. And if you are bound by certain laws or regulations to protect certain pieces of data, this could be a way in which data is not protected if you're using a third-party VPN. So uh, a lot of companies that are doing this kind of setup that are actually using a VPN are going to configure their own VPN, use their own servers located on their own hardware that they own, set up a VPN client. There are lots of open source uh, protocols and softwares out there that they can use in order to make a VPN client and then, you know, get that set up so employees can safely use it without possibly risking any data. Now, the other major benefit that I, I briefly mentioned before is that um, these can protect against some man in the middle attacks. Now, I, I will say that HTTPS does almost the same thing. Um, so really quick. Uh, when I talk about man in the middle, uh, what that means is when your information is going between your computer and the server that you're trying to connect to, a man in the middle attack would be if someone was able to intercept that data in the, in the middle and then read what's going on or maybe change some of that information or something like that for some malicious purpose. And if you are working with particularly sensitive data that it has to be stored at a uh, specific location on company grounds uh, and you're using, you know, you're, you're just connecting to it without a VPN, then um, this could be of concern is if someone is able to intercept that somehow. Um, one possible man in the middle type of thing could be, you know, you could consider your ISP spying on what data you're sending and receiving to be man in the middle. Uh, you could also have a man in the middle where someone, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to do some work at a cafe and access stuff. Uh, at the organization that you work for and someone at the cafe has maliciously set up a fake cafe network that you connect to and they essentially redirect any requests you send to them through the real cafe Wi-Fi. But in the meantime, they're able to try to harvest data. They're able to try to see, um, you know, what you're doing, try to get sensitive information. Or, you know, it's even possible for them to set up fake versions of popular websites that people might be trying to visit. Like, for example, they might set up a fake, a fake banking website that collects usernames and passwords and then just sends you to a error like, oh, no, our website is down. Please come back later. Well, in the meantime, you've given them your username and password and uh, they're able to then use that to get into your banking account and scrape your money or, you know, get all your money out of there. So that would be a man in the middle attack. VPNs can actually prevent against that kind of thing. And this is one of the few cases where I would actually recommend using a VPN is if you're using public Wi-Fi 
like this, uh, no matter what you're doing, a VPN is really beneficial because if you connect to, even if you connect to a fake uh, version of the public Wi-Fi, um, what happens is that all of your connection, all, like, all of your information is encrypted, so they can't try to intercept your request to go to certain websites and present you a fake website instead. Instead, these requests will be meaningless, uh, so they might just be forced to either drop it completely and it looks like that makes it look like that public Wi-Fi isn't working for you, so you get off and go somewhere else, or um, they might just pass it on to your uh, VPN service as normal and they can't really get anything out of there because of the fact that it's encrypted. That's where VPNs are really, really good, is in hyper-specific scenarios like that. If you're doing sensitive work for your organization in public Wi-Fi, a VPN is a great choice because you will be able to do all of that safely without risking any sensitive data that you might be trying to work with. Now, with regards to the ISP thing, uh, ISPs actually spying on your data, uh, I talk about HTTPS right here, uh, doing almost exactly the same thing. If you look at the URL that your web browser is on right now, you'll probably see something like HTTPS colon slash slash uh, HancockCollege.Instructure.com or something like that. Maybe HTTPS colon slash slash YouTube, www.youtube.com or something like that. But specifically, you might see HTTPS at the beginning of that website address. Uh, HTTPS is a secure protocol. What that means is it guarantees a secure connection between you and the website that you're trying to visit. It actually uh, encrypts all the data sent between you and the website that you're visiting. So nobody would be able to see it, not even your ISP, and that only gets unlocked by your computer. And it also guarantees that you are visiting the actual version of the website uh, because HTTPS requires certain certificates that are really hard, if not impossible, to fake. So, the, and these certificates are like certificates of authenticity. So they... Um, make sure that you are actually on the correct version of the website. It's a safety measure against things like the um, public Wi-Fi kind of attack that I was talking about before. Now, if you are trying specifically to hide your browsing information from your ISP, then HTTPS is going to work just fine for that. Uh, you won't really need to make any major changes. You won't even need to use a VPN. The there are like little pieces of information that your ISP would see, which would be things like the website that you're visiting, but that doesn't really tell them much. It doesn't even give them the full URL. It says, "Hey, I'm I'm visiting, uh, say, YouTube.com," but it won't tell them the whole video that you're visiting, and they won't be able to see the contents of the web page that you're looking at, or something like that. So, HTTPS uh, will protect almost everything. Uh, really the main benefit you would get from using a VPN is hiding the actual website IP from your ISP, which isn't all that much of a benefit. So then the other main benefit that you would get from a VPN is uh, changing the location that your requests look like they're coming from for that Netflix example or something like that. So for personal use, VPNs may not be the most helpful unless, well, there there are niche reasons why they would be helpful for you, but I, I can't uh, talk about them here. Um, but for an organization, it would be helpful for making it look like your computer is located within your organization's site so you can access things that only your organization, like only computers on your organization's site should be able to access and also for protecting you against very specific types of attacks inside of public uh, places that give public internet. Um, so yeah, VPNs, a pretty cool technology. 
relatively limited use, but in those uses, they are very helpful. Now, very quickly, the reason why it's called a virtual private network is for the fact that you are making a connection, what, what appears to be a connection from within this uh, Chicago site here, when in reality, you're outside of the Chicago site. So it looks like, it appears to be that you are directly connected within the Chicago site. That's this virtual side of things. The virtual referring to the fact that it appears to be this way, but it isn't in reality. Because the reality is you are connecting through a VPN client, through uh, your ISP, through the internet, through another ISP, to the VPN server, and then to the endpoint where you're actually you know, doing the work and stuff like that. But what it appears to be from the outside is just a simple connection to the uh, all the stuff in the Chicago site in this example. Private, of course, referring to the fact that it is private. The um, information is encrypted. Everything is private and safe from intruders. And the network, you know, the network side of things, it's a virtual network. So the network looks like you are connected to the Chicago site right here. It looks like you have this connection because of the fact that the VPN server is located within the Chicago site. So yeah, it's a virtual network and it's a private network because nobody can really see what's going on. The network really is, the virtual network really is this tunnel that is made through the internet. This tunnel being the connection between the client and the server. So now let's talk about private clouds, which give you all the benefits of cloud architecture. You know, things like resource pooling and resource elasticity and stuff like that with the benefit that because this is a private cloud, it is uh, hosted on servers that you or your organization control, which means that any data that is there is kept safe. And well, I, I, I kind of um, touched on this just now, but the reason why you would want to use a private cloud is when you want to use cloud services and applications that involve data that you have to stay, uh, you have to keep control over for probably regulatory reasons like medical data, financial data, all that kind of stuff. So what you do is you essentially um, set up your own servers. So you're spending the money to maintain your servers, to hire server staff, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you're setting up all the cloud infrastructure on those servers. Things like the Elastic Load Balancer, which uh, allow for the uh, allocation of resources for different uses as needed. All that kind of stuff that we've been talking about with allocating servers for website loads and all that kind of stuff. That's what the Elastic Load Balancer does. You set up the web servers that run things like the uh, all the web applications and all the uh, behind the scenes applications that interface with, in this case, a uh, database server like this. So you have a database and a web server. Um, the web server is running all the database applications that in this case seem to control inventory for uh, a lot of it, but then also all the other applications that are being run. And then the load balancer is making sure that resources are being allocated for every single possible use case of these uh, inventory applications. So, you know, all these people who have different inventory applications, they are probably going to be running different applications based on their different use cases because the people in customer service are going to be using these inventory applications a lot differently than people who are in shipping. And then people who are in sales will be using these inventory applications a lot differently as well. And accounting will be using inventory applications quite a bit differently as well, or even they might all be using different applications whatsoever. So the private cloud right here is going to be um, managing the resources that all these applications are, diff are running 
based on the different needs from the different departments within the actual business. Now, I think this is an example I've brought up before, but let's say in customer service, there is a huge crisis. Uh, a whole bunch of products were shipped out that were bad. And all of a sudden, um, a whole bunch of customers need customer service. They need to order replacement parts. They need to do refunds, whatever. And there's this huge amount of customer service uh, people running instances of their version of the inventory application. So the Elastic Load Balancer would see this, it would start allocating more resources to the customer service applications and maybe taking away resources from, let's say, sales because, well, if there's this huge customer service scandal going on right now, maybe sales aren't really having that busy of a day given that no one wants to buy these broken products. So, uh, the Elastic Load Balancer can take resources away from these sales browsers, provide those resources over to the customer service browsers, maybe start running more applications, maybe give more server power to those uh, applications, and so on and so forth. So you get these benefits that you would normally have with a cloud vendor, uh, you know, going to a cloud vendor and getting their services, but also you have all of this really sensitive inventory data that you can keep on site that you don't have to give to anyone else and hope that they do a good job with it. You know exactly what that data is, you know exactly what's happening to that data, exactly who can access that data, and exactly how uh, everything is interfacing with that data. You have full control over that. And of course, like in the last example where people were able to use a VPN to access uh, local resources on a particular site, if you need to access a private cloud remotely, you can use a VPN. As long as that VPN server is hosted on site, then your connections will look like they are coming from on site and you should be able to access the private cloud just fine from anywhere. So. A VPN works really well with a private cloud. Now there is a downside to using a private cloud and it's that if all of the people who are using space on the private cloud, if they're not really doing much on one particular day, then there would be a lot of probably idle server space with nothing much to do. And, you know, on a regular cloud, a, a cloud vendor wouldn't really have idle server space because they could reallocate one company's idle server stuff to another company. Uh, they could shuffle all that server space around as needed. They have so many customers that they really don't end up with a lot of idle server space, but that's not necessarily the case for a private cloud, especially if a smaller company had a private cloud, uh, they probably would end up with a lot of idle server space that's kind of going to waste. It's kind of just drawing power and not really doing much. So a private cloud isn't a great fit for everyone. Uh, maybe if you have like really large uh, companies that are handling things like hospital related medical data or something like that, that would be really useful for that could be really useful for a private cloud. Um, companies like uh, like really, really large companies might be able to make use of a private cloud. Any company that is able to find a passive use for extra server space, um, you know, for whatever reason, if they're doing a lot of things like rendering videos or folding proteins in order to try to discover cure for cures for things like cancers or all kinds of stuff. Um, if they have uses for idle servers, then that could be fine. They could run those kinds of programs when there's less load, like at nighttime or over the weekend or something like that. And then when there's more load, they could scale back that kind of work while the people who actively need server space are able to do things actively. So 
really, um, a private cloud isn't going to be the most helpful. Uh, odds are you might as well just, if you need uh, privacy and security guarantees on your data, you might as well just have a um, an actual server where you host all that data and then all the other stuff, all the web applications, anything that doesn't interface directly with that data could be outsourced to a cloud vendor. So, and a lot of companies tend to do that. If they even need a private cloud, they'll probably be outsourcing as much as they can to a public cloud and then leave the private cloud type of stuff for the things that explicitly need to be private. But yeah, not something you'll see very much, not something that will be super helpful for most organizations. Now you can sort of attempt to get the best of both worlds here using a virtual private cloud, which essentially what you do is you rent out a bunch of space on a public cloud and you set up a virtual private cloud, which essentially acts as if you have your own private cloud, but it's running on a public cloud vendors servers. So you put stuff on their infrastructure, you encrypt it so that nobody from that cloud company is actually able to um, see what's going on. You only connect to it through a VPN so that nobody can intercept the connection between your servers and the virtual private cloud. So you're creating a tunnel from your local servers where you would probably save all of your sensitive data and stuff like that. You're creating a tunnel, creating a tunnel directly between that and the virtual private cloud, which maybe has other data that you store on there, but then might also have things that interact with the um, sensitive data that you have stored on your local drive. And you have to be a little bit careful about how you set this up because you can't, you know, you really have to make sure that this VPN connection between uh, your organization's servers and the virtual private cloud are holding up. You have to trust that encryption. You have to trust that the public cloud vendor isn't going to mess with anything that you have going on. You need to trust that everything on their end is actually encrypted so nobody from outside can see inside. They can't see the kind of work that you're doing with the data that you're working with. So essentially what you're doing is you are trying to make this um, secure area within a public cloud that only you know what's going on inside of only you. And by, when I say you, I should say your organization. People within your organization are able to see what's going on in there. Only people within the organization can control the data that's passing in and out of that area. Everything that goes in and comes out is private. It's encrypted because of the fact that all of that, all of that data is being funneled through a VPN. So that's the idea of a virtual private cloud. It's trying to make essentially the best of both worlds. You don't have to worry about things like idle servers or investing in server hardware for the applications that work with your sensitive data or things like that because you can use the public cloud vendors server hardware and all that kind of stuff they handle all the resource elasticity and all that kind of stuff they um, are able to deal with any sort of idle servers and they can handle the load that you might put on their stuff so you don't have to worry about the actual hardware regarding the um, web applications that you're hosting or whatever you're doing with the cloud. So you're essentially sectioning off a piece of the public cloud and making it highly restricted, requiring secure access in order to actually do anything with it. It can be built over the existing public cloud infrastructure provided by vendors. Um, you have to trust the cloud vendor and the encrypted connection between them. So that would also mean trusting the VPN, whether that's using a uh, third-party VPN, you have to trust that VPN company, or whether it's um, building a VPN yourself, you have to trust the integrity of 
your VPN. Uh, so you have to trust that they won't look at your data, trust that they won't close your server and make that data inaccessible. And it's still, it still really isn't that good for data that has to be super controlled and private. And the reason why is because you could store all the private data on your servers at your organization's actual office or warehouse or whatever. You can store all that data on site. But if you are accessing that data through a cloud application, whether it's a public or pri virtual private cloud, um, you're still making copies of that data. You're still sending copies of that data across the internet onto the hardware that belongs to someone else, whether it's encrypted or not, that still could be touchy because what if they're able to break that encryption? If you've done it right, they theoretically shouldn't be able to break it, but they could try brute forcing it and they could get really lucky and you really don't know how safe it actually is. There's no guarantees of safety when you do this. So it's still that much, it's still not great for data where it has to be private through regulation and legal requirement, all that kind of stuff. All right, well, that's a brief discussion of uh, security when it comes to the cloud. Thank you all very much for watching.